Okay, here are the specifications for the uh, 7.62 by 54 rim. Your bore diameter, okay, or the hole that goes in there should be 300 thousandths. You have a six thousandths groove depth. Now the groove is on both sides of the bore. So you're cutting a groove six thousandths deep on each side of the bore. So you multiply that by two and you get twelve thousandths. So on a thing, the groove diameter should be three hundred and twelve thousandths. It's a three hundred thousandths diameter bore with two grooves cut six thousandths deep, which makes that groove diameter three hundred and twelve thousandths. That's how it works. Now, when you have tolerances in that, this is a rifle barrel. There's an object of a certain size going to be traveling down this tube at a million miles an hour. So, usually the tolerance you have plus or minus. Say it's 300 thousandths, you can go 5 thousandths more, 5 thousandths less. With a rifle barrel that is not true. If you have any play or any tolerance variance, it would be noted on the print that it is plus so much minus zero. In other words, when machining a rifle barrel, this is the size it cannot go under. If it goes under, it is very bad, very dangerous. So your tolerance can go up only. Can't be smaller, can be bigger. So, the usual standard in the old days was plus or minus or be plus or minus five. So in this case, let's say it's five thousandths. Let's say this is the maximum. All right, and that's just a guess. I'm not sure if it is or not. So using that 305, you can go from 300, you can go as big as 305. Okay. Again with the six thousandths, add to 12. Your groove diameter 317. We'll use this as an extreme. That means if you're slugging your bore and it's 317, you're kind of at the maximum. But in reality, 3,000 probably sounds better. Okay? So using that, it's an average. 303 would be the bore diameter, 315 the groove diameter. This is kind of like a happy medium. It is not exactly tight like that. And I doubt you'll find anything like that. A couple thousandths bigger is better. Two or three. You still have accuracy. And even if you go all the way to the max. Okay. So we know how to get the groove diameter. So what I've done is I've measured the bore diameter. And then that way I can compare it and see how it all looks. If I got six thousandths deep groove or whatever. So let me show you how I did that. All right, in Log Cabin Loom's video, he takes a bullet, or he takes a live round, and he's, he shows you, watch the video, he places the bullets into the bore and compares them. I mean, you got to compare them side by side or mark the bullet somehow to see the depth. That's how he's doing what they call a bullet test, a kind of an on-the-fly bore measurement. What I have is precision gauge pins. Now these are a machinist thing. You gotta get these in a machine shop. They come in a set. And what these are is precision ground pins. And they're ground within tenths of a thousandths guaranteed because they're gauge, they're also called gauge pins. Like and it's marked here three hundred thousandths. This is a three hundred thousandths gauge pin. Now when you're checking something with a pin, okay, if the pin fits in the hole loosely, okay, that means that, say this goes in here 300, all right, 300 thousandths. And we're going to go with this one, which is 301. 301 I put in. It fits in. 301 fits in there. I put 302 in. I start to get some resistance. 
What this is telling me is probably this bore, and we pick 303. 303 don't want to go in. How that works is, is just because a 302 goes in does not mean it's 302. In order for this pin to fit in there, okay, you got to have a thousandths play. Rule of thumb is the actual size of that bore, because there's resistance, it's, 30, it's 302 and a half, I'd say that goes in a bit, 303. So this bore diameter is 303, three thousandths. Okay, and that's how I measure it. And how you get that is, if the pin goes in loosely, like a 302, it don't go in that one. See if it goes in this one. I don't want to go in that one, that's a 301. Generally using these gauge pins, if the 302 pin goes in, that means that the actual bore diameter is 303. And that's how I'm measuring it. And that's how I do it. You know, you really can't do this at a gun show or something. This is more technical. And I've had the guns out and I've measured them all. And I'll review what I've found as compared to my slugs. Okay? And now I'm getting an idea of what the bore is, what the groove diameter is, and how it's varying. And I also have the years marked down. I have pre-war and I have uh, wartime production. So this, you know, that's how I did the measurements. Now the armors actually have a rod like this. It'll be a precision rod, and what they'll do is they'll have two of them, be a go and a no go. You'll have like, uh, say, 304, 305. You take the rifle, you stick the rod in, 304 don't go in, okay? But my 301, oh, slides in which means that the rifle's good. And the reason they use the rod, the length of the barrel, is because there could be variances, bad spots, high spots, whatever. But this is just a basic quick check. And that's how I did it. There are armor tools. When these were re-arsenaled, they probably run a long precision ground rod down these barrels and check them out to make sure they were spec. And basically, if you get the bigger rod going, it means the barrel's worn out and it's no good. There is a specification. But we're looking mainly at about two or three thousandths, okay, not more than five. And I'll kind of go over the results here and tell you what I got and see what I found out from these different guns. Okay. Now here's basically, I went and I tested all of these guns. It's getting late, I gotta get moving here. I measured them all. I did not slug them all, I run out of lead sinkers. So some of them I've slugged, some of them I haven't. But I've measured the bore diameter on all the rifles I have. And what I found, I got a couple old 91s, a Finnish ones, a Westinghouse, and another older one. They seem to have a little bit of a counter bore in them just a slight, you know, you can't even really notice it. But it looks like the fins kind of put a false muzzle or counterboard them slightly, you know, about that much in there where it starts to engage. Uh, the rest of the guns are not counterboard. Okay, so I found that the 91s, one of them, uh, the Westinghouse is a little bit more worn, took a 302 pin, would go in, 303 wouldn't. The old one, a 301 pin, would slide in, 302 wooden. So that's putting the bore at about 302. So I'm kind of correct in saying that you're not going to find one to be 300 exactly. It would be a 299 pin would slide in and a 300 pin would not. That would be, three, that's too tight. 301 pin gliding in means it's about 302. So I've had one, two, three, four, five, six, six guns. All the guns up until the one in 1936, okay, up to 1936, all took a 301 pin. So they got about a 302 diameter, which would be a 314 groove diameter. 
Now I got a 1939 Tula. Now that's another thing. Everybody, oh, Tulas are worth more. Some of the online places, even if you want a Tula Arsenal mark, it's $20 extra to hand select that. I've heard people make comments, Tulas are more valuable. Um, I don't see that, I don't know where that came from. The only information I found is that Tula stopped making for a few years, 9130s, or nine, you know, most Nagan 9130s, because they uh, concentrated on producing the Russian semi-automatic rifle. That was a big deal, because the U.S. had an M1 Garand in that, and so Stalin wanted his troops armed with that gun, even though it didn't quite work well and there were some problems with it. I've never owned one or shot one, but from what I've read, I believe there were some problems with them early designs. But, PR-wise, whenever troops were marching in the Red Square, like for the May Day celebration during the war, everybody was carrying a semi-automatic rifle, whether it worked or not. And Stalin wanted them produced, Stalin wanted them out there, he wanted to be on par with the U.S., okay, and that's kind of what it was. So Tula, for a period of years, at least that's what the book said, stopped making 9130s. So there's, I think, a couple of years, wartime years, where you're not going to find them. Okay, so they made, out of the 35 million, they made 5 million less or something, okay? And so, but there is no difference. And my 39 Tula took a 303 pin. Okay, so the bore's worn out or shot out on it, even though it's a Tula. You want to pay me an extra 20 bucks for it? I'll sell it. And then we go, and now here's where the gun geek brings it up that during the war, tolerance has got out of control and everything else. I got a Zvonsk uh, 1941 that takes a 301 pin. My 43 takes a 302 pin. And now I got a 44 is Izvansk that takes a 301 pin. It's tight. You know, they're down there. And the Polish carbine, which I think is more worn out, it's taken a 303 pin. I slugged it. That's let me see where the hell my slug is on that. Yeah, 303 plus 12, 15. Yep, it's slugging upright. 315 is the groove diameter. So it's it's a little bit bigger. It could be wear. I think that gun was in service and used and shot like crazy during the Cold War. Now, let's compare our slugs. Okay. 1925, 301, plus 12, 313. So, yes. It's corresponding from the bore diameter to a 6,000 depth groove diameter. Uh, 39 Tula which is big, 303 plus 12, 315. Again, corresponds 6,000 steps. Here's the strange thing I've run across. My 1936 Ivansk, which is pre-war gun geek. Now this one, 301 pin don't go in, okay? But it's slugging 316, which I calculate about a seven and a half thousandths Groove diameter depth. Okay, so it's thousands and a half deeper on each side, two, three thousandths more than what it should be. Um, it could be when they were running it, and this was not during the war, 1936, the tool got dull. Or they cut the groove diameter a little deep. So, see, you get this weird stuff. And if you use that, well, it's a hex receiver, it's pre war, it's going to be better than a wartime. Uh, I, I don't, you know, that's not particularly true. I haven't slugged the wartime guns, because like I said, I run out of the sinkers to match them up, but I'm going to record all this ammo, keep it in my studies, and this is a progressive work. And so far, we're kind of proving out, what I'd like to prove is, um, yeah, you know, if you're just, at a gun show or in a shop trying to look at the gun, it's going to be hard. There, there's really no 100% definite way for you to just pick up a gun and simply check it, say it's got, other than looking down the bore. The bore's clean and the bore's good, you know, go with that, your eye. 
And the only thing is, though, if you're buying a round receiver wartime, it may be out of spec slightly, but I'm proving that if the boards are good, they're not. They're just as tight tolerance-wise as that. I'll prove that out. So a round receiver doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. That wear also can come from use. The gun was made in 1939 or something, but somebody shot the hell out of it during the war and he refinished it. You know, that tool is probably what it is. It's just been used in combat, probably, and probably used a lot. So, saying, oh, well, go with a hex receiver and pay the extra money and you'll be getting a better shooting gun is not quite true. There, there's truth behind it, but it might not work out that way. And I found that you got some nice World War II round receivers, even though the machine marks are crappy on them and that. The damn bores are tight. They should shoot good. I'm going to eventually go out and shoot these, but as you can see, this takes a long time. It's a long, drawn-out process, and I just ain't got the time to do it fast. But my results will be documented, and I can explain to you to the minute detail of what affects the accuracy of these guns. Okay, I know a lot of you can't get into it as deep as I am, but I'd like to dispel a lot of the rumors in that by proving it out. And we've kind of proved it out, you know, uh, that 44 is right there, 301, like the pre-wars. There's a pre-war barrel on there. And... Like I said, it's hard to say because there's a lot of factors involved in what affects these guns and just on the fly at a gun show or shop looking real quick and, and being 100% definite, uh, there, there is no way. It's potluck. The guns are inexpensive. Buy it if you don't like the way it shoots. Trade it. Sell it off. Give it away to somebody, your nephew or something. Um, and then buy another one. And just keep buying them until you find one that works. Well, that's it for now, and as I get more work into it, I'll have another video. I'm sorry to take long, but I want you to understand the depth of it. You know, maybe this ain't for everybody, but somebody, I hope, will get some information from this.